Good morning. We're right at eight o'clock and I see that we've got great attendance. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. My name is Hunter Hill. I'm a member of the BGR Board of Directors and Chairman of the Breakfast Briefing Committee. I'm excited to welcome you to BGR's second virtual breakfast briefing of 2020. BGR is a private, nonprofit, independent research organization dedicated to inform public policy making and the effective use of public resources for the improvement of government in the New Orleans metropolitan area. BGR's research, reports, and government monitoring are hallmarks of its public policy work in Jefferson, Orleans, and St. Tammany parishes. Breakfast briefings further BGR's mission by allowing citizens and policymakers to discuss issues that affect all of our lives. We encourage you to share this event with others who may be interested. Please use the social media hashtag BGR briefing. As many of you know, each breakfast briefing includes the opportunity for attendees to submit questions for us to pose to our speaker. Today, we will receive your questions through the Q&A icon at the bottom center of your screen. When you click the icon, a box will appear and you may submit a question by typing it in the Q&A box and hitting return. We hope to see you again at future BGR breakfast briefings, whether in person or virtual. We thank you for responding so enthusiastically to this event and for staying engaged in public policy discussions important to our community. And now to introduce our topic this morning and then moderate the Q&A portion is Amy Glavinsky, BGR's president and CEO. Thank you, Hunter. I'd like to first express gratitude to Iberia Bank First Horizon for so generously sponsoring BGR's breakfast briefing series again this year. Your support allows us to create these events and make them free to the public. We welcome everyone who has joined us today and encourage you to visit our website, bgr.org, to access our report library. It includes more than 200 public policy reports that BGR has produced over the past 25 years. And now for an introduction to today's topic. Many cities are re-examining their approaches to law enforcement and public safety in response to the tragic deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and others at the hands of police officers and the nationwide protests that followed. Cities are asking important questions. Are there police forces serving and protecting citizens in a just and accountable manner? What alternatives to traditional policing might help improve public safety outcomes? And what changes to law, policy, and funding would be necessary to implement them? New Orleans is no exception to this national conversation, but it is already well-versed on the topic of police reform. The New Orleans Police Department has spent the past eight years pursuing compliance with a federal consent decree. Among its successes are an innovative peer intervention model for officers, policies to reduce the use of force, and a reform of paid detail. The NOPD has also shown its ability to collaborate with community organizations. Examples include assisting the homeless and victims of sexual assault and domestic violence. However, important work remains to be done under the consent decree to ensure constitutional policing. In addition, policymakers must ensure that oversight structures can sustain the reforms after the consent decree ends. These and other issues make today's conversation about the future of policing in New Orleans truly unique and important. And here today to help us develop our understanding of the issues are two New Orleanians with unique perspectives. Ken Polite Jr. served as a U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of Louisiana from 2013 to 2017. During his tenure, he led initiatives to address civil rights violations and public corruption. He also developed a mentoring program for at-risk youth. Kenneth is, is currently in private practice in Philadelphia. Sean Ferguson began his career with the NOPD as a patrol officer. He held a variety of leadership roles within the department before becoming its superintendent in January of 2019. We will begin by allowing our presenters to share with you their conversation about the future of policing in New Orleans. We will then have time for questions from the audience 
Kenneth and Superintendent Ferguson, thank you both tremendously for joining us today. The floor is now yours. Thank you very much, Amy, and good morning to everyone in attendance. Uh, I want to make sure I thank BGR as well as Hunter and Marcy for their efforts in organizing today's event. And Chief Ferguson, certainly want to thank you for giving your time this morning. How are you today? Uh, good morning, Kenny. Thank you. Thank you, Amy, BGR, Hunter, as well as Marcy for uh, allowing us to have this opportunity to have this uh, very important conversation. Chief, we don't have much time this morning. Uh, and so I want to go ahead and jump into our conversation. Uh, I'd like to start out with you giving us just a level set in terms of where we are right now in terms of police officers. Uh, if you could touch on questions of recruiting, obviously we are in a very challenging environment for all of us. Uh, policing remains a very difficult calling. Uh, how many officers do we have right now? How many are we, are we recruiting? How many are we losing? And are we seeing higher rates of attrition in this environment right now? Thank you. That, that is a great question, especially given the climate that we're in now. Currently, uh, New Orleans Police Department is staffed at just over 1,200 officers uh, on our police department. Uh, our attrition rate is approximately 6%, 5 to 6% which is what we normally see. It is average. This is the same as what we saw last year. So we are in a great place compared to some agency give, agencies across the country, given the, the social unrest that you are seeing. Uh, you're seeing uh, attrition rates uh, double, triple, quadruple, I mean, in the hundreds uh, in some agencies. So we are very, very much in a great place. I, I like to think our mayor, our CAO, as well as our partners at the Police Foundation, because we are still able to recruit in a great manner. We just started a class last week, class 191, had 25 recruits. We had a class to start in July. So we are continuing to recruit and we continue to press forward, although we have this, this, this social unrest climate that we are dealing with. Chief, when you talk about concepts around recruiting, oftentimes we, we touch on uh, national recruiting versus local recruiting. How does that connect with improving community policing and what efforts have you undertaken and NOPD under your leadership undertaken to improve local recruiting? So the, to start with recruiting in itself, we, we started a national testing program this year with uh, the Police Foundation to bring more uh, awareness to our department one, to give more opportunity for testing at their various uh, locations, states all over the country uh, to become a New Orleans police officer should they meet our standards. Uh, but the biggest push that we have been pushing for most recently is the local uh, recruitment. Our uh, reason being, we, see, we find that there's more of a vested interest in uh, our community from our locals. And there's nothing, absolutely nothing against any of our uh, officers who are from out of state because they have come and joined our team and have been just as much a part of this community as we are. But we know we tend to get the commitment of longevity commitment from our local applicants and our local officers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mentioned community policing, Chief, so let's dive into that issue a little bit and I, I that's a phrase that I, I, I think applies to a different a couple different uh, contexts that are appropriate for our conversation here. First of all, when we talk about community policing in building community trust, improving the relationships between law enforcement and the people that they serve and protect, where are we right now in the city of New Orleans, in your opinion, in terms of community trust in NOPD? And what are you doing right now to improve community trust between your officers in the communities? I think, I think that we're in a great position with community trust. Uh, it starts with what the foundation is with our department now, which is transparency. Uh, we're, we're more open with regards to our body one camera footage. Uh, we are releasing our 10 day release policy that we implemented ourselves voluntarily. Uh, we continue to work with our community liaison officers that are assigned to various districts to help be their liaison between the community and various departments at City Hall. I implemented a 
program or initiative called geographical deployment, which outlines every district is split into four different sectors and officers are assigned to that, that specific sector every day. The same officers are assigned to the same sector every day. And they're walking is, the same, they're walking the same sectors each day. Same sector, walking or patrolling the same sector every day. This this creates an environment in which they are able to learn that community, able to establish a relationship with that community, and the community is able to establish the same trust in that officer, and knowing, and getting to know one another. And that that builds relationships in itself. Uh, you know, normally we would have our non-pack meeting, which every district captain has an opportunity monthly to meet with the constituents or the stakes stakeholders of their district every month. But given the uh, climate that we're in with COVID-19, we have not been able to do that. But just Chief, last make sure month- you, Chief, make sure you tell our audience what NOMPAC is, by the way. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, so our neighbor, New Orleans Neighborhood uh, Police uh, Association, and it's about the community supporting the police or coming yeah. to see what the police, their police department or the police officers of their community is doing? What are the crime trends? What are the issues? What are the concerns within their community? And this creates a dialogue between that community and the commanding officer or the staff of that particular district. And in doing that, um, we have not been able to do this again since the beginning of COVID-19. So right. in October, we're hoping to go into a, a virtual atmosphere of non pack in which uh, the stakeholders of various districts will be able to sign up and have that dialogue, have that communication with their commanding officer of their district to express their concerns, but also learn what is that captain or what is that their officers doing to uh, better their community and support their community. Very good, Chief. Uh, and I want to, we may get back to the, some, some topics related to that, but I want to move on to the, another concept of community policing. We do have a number of neighborhoods in our, in our New Orleans area that have their own local patrols, uh, uh, Lakeview, Mid-City, other areas. Um, is that a trend that you see as continuing to grow within the city of New Orleans, local neighborhoods funding those private patrols? Do you have any questions related or concerns related to the transparency or accountability of those uh, law enforcement officers when they're operating in that, that capacity? So the, it is a great resource. It is, it is a great support mechanism for our department in itself. Uh, I definitely do not have any questions. Or, or I do not question the integrity or transparency of those patrols because it is our officers who are working these uh, these various assignments. And they are reporting, like Mid-City is reporting to uh, Captain Roberts, as well as Lakeview is reporting to Sergeant Benjamin under the leadership of Captain Lebrano. So they are reporting, there's a direct dialogue to ensure that those patrols are aware of the concerns of the district or that captain uh, concerns, what what may be uh, on, the, on, the, on the horizon in those particular areas. So I definitely do not have any concerns whatsoever. They have been phenomenal. Uh, we recently had some arrests by uh, some of the Lakeview patrols. So we continue to press forward and work with our neighborhoods across the city to ensure safety. Uh, I know you asked the question about, do I feel that this is something that, that should grow or will grow? Uh, in certain parts of the, uh, of the city, I think it can grow, it has an opportunity to grow. It, it is just a matter of being willing to commit to do to do just that. I uh, know that many feel, hey, the police department should in itself uh, do its due diligence in, in, in servicing our constituents, but uh, we can always use help. Uh, we, we, we're looking to grow. So just as we're looking to grow in numbers, uh, we're looking to grow in support. And those two, you know, we've touched on both Lakeview and Mid-City. I know that both of those are typically staffed by off-duty officers. So I agree with you that that's a, those two are, are, are solid examples of that accountability and supervision being in place. But where you have organizations where there are not officers, for example, mm -hmm. and security, secure private security, uh, I guess that would be my, my question to you. Do you have concerns about the accountability or transparency of those types of uh, security functions when they're operating in that capacity? 
So yes, in some instances you do, you do. But you know, there are some security companies that actually uh, do their part in ensuring that they are tied into the the, the leadership of those various districts. I, mm-hmm. uh, as I was the captain of the second district, uh, we had New Orleans Pirate yeah. Patrol who patrolled the Upper Garden District, and, and they attended our weekly staff meeting to uh, ensure that us that they were a part of the team and they wanted to be a part of the solution and not a part of the problem and to make sure that we knew who to contact should we have any issues. Uh, so these are some of the things that we're looking at pressing forward again and asking these security companies, come join our team and 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 establish those relationships so we do not have any further concerns. Excellent. I appreciate that level of coordination uh, where possible. The, the last formulation of community policing chief, which you know, really frames the discussion this morning is communities helping to police themselves, right? So the notion of uh, neighborhood organizations, individual uh, members of our New Orleans community working with or separate from NOPD, but, but, but engaging in efforts that improve public safety nonetheless. Uh, you know, lots of buzzwords, lots of uh, mm-hmm. buzzwords mm-hmm. out there about this issue. We, we can address this from the, the, the uh, perspective of budgeting. We could talk about it from issues of prioritization of, uh, of law enforcement, both at the state and at the federal levels. Tell me what role in your mind do you envision neighborhood organizations, individual citizens playing in terms of improving public safety in the city of New Orleans? Well, I mean, to begin with, uh, we, we, we as a community, we as a city, we, we are very close knit. So we, 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 we do not hesitate to talk to one another about <laughs> what is going on in our That's various me. neighborhoods or, or what have you. But can, are we willing to take that conversation to the next level, to law enforcement, to the various individuals who are departments who are responsible for public safety in itself? So our communities have been doing an outstanding job with that. Uh, I just think that is a, this is a holistic picture that we have to, to view, uh, looking at education, looking at economics and things of that nature from the community perspective. How do we improve that? in in itself would improve, in my opinion, public safety. To get in front of it from the beginning, therefore there would not be an interaction at the end. Uh, Unfortunately, a negative interaction with policing at the end. And so I know, Chief, we've we've talked about this publicly and privately before, so I know your commitment to prevention as being a critical part of of improving public safety. let me ask you this. Do you think that there is too much on the plate of, a, of an officer on a day-to-day basis uh, in terms of public safety or issues that may touch on public safety? You've mentioned uh, things like education, but even things like mental health or, or, or home issues of homelessness, uh, food security, uh, any number of, of, of uh, tasks that an officer may be called to address on a day-to-day basis. Is there, are there too many on the on the plate of an officer unfortunately yes you know growing up uh through the ranks of the department that's something that we as officers have constantly had a conversation of uh you know calling ourselves psychologists psychiatrists uh, Mm -hmm. counselors things of that nature you know because we are placed in a position that uh, we are dealing with situations that are not necessarily criminal activity that we should be involved in uh medical experts more or less should be involved in. Uh, but I think it is easy to put or, or have law enforcement involved in such situations because we are the around the clock uh, security post, if you would say. Uh, uh-huh. Policing is 24 uh, seven. We're, we're not a nine to five Monday through Friday type business. So it is easy to dial 911 to call the police because someone is having an argument with someone you don't want that to escalate to anything violent. but. Are we the appropriate responders? I, I, I don't think so. And I think if we can take ourselves or remove ourselves away f- from some of these non-criminal uh, incidents, we can then pay more attention and address the true issues uh, that, that, that lies out there, meaning violent crime specifically. Mm-hmm. 
So creating an infrastructure of resources to address what you just described as non-criminal incidents, it, you know, it requires money, right? It requires yeah. money for yeah. us to be able yes. to address those. In your view, yeah. is uh, that money, whether it comes from state, local, or federal, uh, should it be taken from or reallocated from traditional law enforcement? Um, you know, where should the money come from? I mean, that we, it sounds like we agree that there needs to be more investment mm -hmm. in that infrastructure, but you know, where's the money come from? So I think you, we should be investing more into law enforcement. You can apply that or attach that to law enforcement to where we have actually had, we have some counselors on our department. And, and what we are trying to do is establish a, a, a counselor in every district so that that counselor can do some follow-up calls with some of our domestic violence cases or some of our mm -hmm. other non-criminal cases to hopefully a, a, attach these citizens to some other resources. So uh, not defunding or taking away from the police department, but adding more to assist with those type of so services, unless there is an outside entity to apply those type of services. And even then, I would say the answer would not be to remove funding from policing in itself, because at the end of the day, our responsibility is to address crime within the city, and we will still need the resources that are required to do just that. Thank you, Chief. I know we'll have some questions, some more dialogue on that, but I appreciate your candor on that topic. Before we move to, to, uh, to Q&A, because we're, we're really up against time, we didn't even get a chance to really touch on the consent decree, but I'm sure we may get to that topic yes. as part of the questions. I want to talk about violent crime, uh, mm -hmm. particularly gun violence in the city of New Orleans. Uh, it is, we're, we're seeing a very violent 2020. Can you talk a little bit about what you think are the root causes of that? What are the trends that you're seeing nationally in that same area? And, and what are you doing to help respond, to help mitigate that violence that we're seeing increasing on our streets? Yes, thank, thank you for that question. So if you look at, there's a document that was uh, issued out last month by the National Commission on COVID-19 and Criminal Justice um, to, to speak just to that. It looked at 27 cities, major cities across the country. New Orleans was not one of them, but nevertheless, what we saw in this document is similar to what we're seeing here in New Orleans. Uh, 53% increase in homicide, 14% increase in uh, non-fatal shootings or gun assaults, as they would call it, on a national level. So you're mm -hmm. seeing that violent crime uptick across the country. And, and we definitely have seen it here. Uh, we are at about a 58, 59% increase in homicide here ourselves. So we are, working with our state and federal partners to try to tweak some things that we can possibly do differently uh, in handling some of these investigations. Uh, we have changed our way with, through geo deployment to try to put officers more in the community as opposed to being on a major thoroughfares to be a part of the community and learn more about what is occurring uh, throughout our city and try to be, stay in front of that. Uh, mm -hmm. it, is, it, it is a daunting task that we'll continue to press forward with. But uh, I have no doubt and our offices have made numerous homicide arrests within the last few weeks, as well as armed robbery and non-fatal shooting arrests. So our officers remain engaged, although we're in a, a challenging climate, talking about mm -hmm. COVID-19, how do you engage but stay socially distanced? You know, dealing with hurricane season, you, you have to, I'm no medical expert, but I think about, you cannot have this conversation without discussing the mental aspect of everyone, meaning the officers themselves, meaning our citizens, our constituents, with regards to, we had homicides as a result of road rage, homicides as a result of domestic violence, homicide as a result of mental illness. So there, there are a variety of things in which could be a, a underlying cause into the violent uptick that we have seen lately. I, uh, I agree with you, Chief, that there could be any number of root causes, including mental health uh, and mental distress, trauma uh, related to some of the circumstances that we're dealing with uh, in our communities. And as and I think it's an important point that you raise. New Orleans is not isolated here. This is a national trend uh, that we're seeing. This is across any number of cities. 
uh, both Democratic and Republican led, as, as our friend Jeff yes. Asher recently discussed in the New York Times article. Uh, let me ask you this about a, another potential root cause that's been thrown out there. I'd be interested in your in your perspective in that. Do, when you think about the protests combined with the rise in violence, is there any concern that the public is losing legitimacy in law enforcement? And so that is contributing in, in some ways um, to the increase in violence? Absolutely. I, mean, I think that is just as much a part of this conversation as well. Uh, you know, given and we as law enforcement professionals, uh, we, we, we have our concerns in itself because the vast majority is for the right. And we're out there trying to do our job the right way. But it, take, it, it only takes one, one bad rotten apple that magnifies or outshines the good that has been done by our officers. So absolutely, so our community across the country, not necessarily just in New Orleans, but across the country, has a certain feeling of distrust with law enforcement in itself, a total disregard for authority as well uh, as a result of what you've been seeing over the last several months. Absolutely. And, and again, that authority, you know, when we think of authority derives from the people. So again, if the people yes. don't feel like that authority is connected to their priorities and is actually helping to protect and serve them, you, you have some of the, the distrust arise uh, yeah, that we're talking about here. Let me ask you this, Chief. Do you, do you uh, is this young people in our communities that are committing the, the violence? You know, oftentimes we, we get questions around it's the young people that are committing much of the violence and what do we do about mm -hmm. young people in the city of New Orleans? Um, tell me a little bit about our, our youthful offenders and their engagement in this world. So we, with, our, with regards to our violent offenses, it is not just our young people. We, we, we have adults who are making these poor decisions as well. Now, we have been, you know, 2019, I, I, I messaged probably the entire year about auto burglaries and the, and the issues that we had and concerns that we had with our juveniles. Mm -hmm. uh, ironically, in 2020, our auto burglaries are down. However, you've seen an uptick within the last month or two, and, and that is once again, our juveniles starting to uh, engage in this criminal activity. But violent crime, it is, it, is, it, it is across the board from juveniles to adults to older people. But again, it goes back to the, the different root causes that has triggered this in itself. So to address it, you know, we have made arrests. We have identified individuals. Uh, Captain Walls has been phenomenal in, in reaching out to families of some of our juvenile offenders just to try to see what resources can be attached to them. But in doing that, you know, incarceration, I would not say is the answer, but we need some accountability factors that hold any offender accountable for their action. Uh, if it's a program that they're mandated to attend on a daily basis, something to ensure that they are being, their mind is occupied. As my grandmother used to always say, I don't mind is the devil's workshop. So. We need to make sure that they are being given some resources to keep mm -hmm. them busy and not to engage in the criminal activity. And so you're you're describing accountability as you know detection, making the arrest, not but you're it could be incarceration for some, but not exclusively. It sounds like that's not Absolutely. the only tool that you're you're pointing to for increasing accountability. Absolutely, I mean there there could be some other uh, programs. I know uh, uh, Youth and Family Services in the Mayor's Office had uh, the early reporting system ERP uh, program in which you have some of our juveniles who are going after school. They're mandated to check in and report to this program on a daily basis, things of that nature in which the judges can uh, apply or attach these offenders to, but ensuring there's some accountability to ensure that they are doing what they have been challenged to do. Absolutely. Another resource that requires money, of course. Absolutely, uh, absolutely, unfortunately. Uh, we've got just a couple more minutes uh, mm -hmm. here before Q&A, Chief. Let's talk a little bit about the consent decree, uh, yes. particularly when we, in the context of, of, of the future of NOPD. You've been under the consent decree since 2012, 2013. 
uh, lots of time, uh, sweat equity, money uh, invested in the success of the consent decree. Where are we right now? What are the next steps towards attaining substantial compliance uh, for the consent decree? So we, we, I think we've gotten down to about six buckets. And of the six, I, I am expecting substantial compliance in three of them uh, within the next month or so, hopefully. Uh, those three buckets are uh, community engagement, uh, as well as recruitment and public integrity bureau, meaning our use of force reporting and things of that nature. Uh, the, the monitors, as well as the DOJ is reviewing those documents now. Uh, we expect substantial compliance within the next few weeks on that. However, we still have three more buckets that we are, are, are um, working towards. Stop search and arrest supervision, which is close and effective supervision, as well as evaluations. Um, I, I would like to commend the judge, uh, as well as our monitors and the DOJ. They have been very uh, intentional in trying to make sure that we are on the right path, meaning we're having weekly meetings to make sure that everyone is doing what is needed to be done, not just from the police department standpoint, but as well as the monitors, as well as the DOJ, to make sure everyone is doing what is needed to be done so that we can move forward with this. And you're really starting to see that this will is starting to get some traction and moving forward towards full compliance. And, and, and the monitors have uh, alluded to a few times, even if we do not completely get there, at least we have the protocols in place to sustain what has been put in place. And that is what we're working towards ensuring that we are in a position to sustain everything that we've accomplished because we refuse to go backwards. Excellent. There's a couple of other policies I know that have really come up outside of the requirements of the consent decree, but have nonetheless garnered a great deal of attention uh, nationally and mm -hmm. locally from our city council. Uh, the use of tear gas, and yes. the use of high risk warrants, no knock warrants. Could you touch a yes. little bit on, on, on both of those and where we are uh, with an NOPD and responding to, to those uh, particular uh, areas on both policy and training? Absolutely. So we, we have worked diligently with council member banks on uh, the tear gas policy in itself and working with him, uh, we established protocol. You know, we had that unfortunate encounter on June 3rd uh, and, and in doing so that brought awareness to some of the things that we did or did not have in place at that time. So we've established some protocols that we have drafted and they are now being vetted by the Department of Justice to move forward with just that. Uh, the tear gas in itself should only be used in a life or death situation. Uh, you know, you go back, you look at that at June 3rd, the night of June 3rd, and how could we have done some things differently? How could we have did it differently? Uh, one point is maybe identifying agitators and remove them as peacefully as best as we can. Uh, giving warnings, more clear uh, and direct warning to everyone and, and informing them, hey, we need you to remove yourselves from this area or this will, you know, this is what could potentially happen. So we looked at many things and our protocols now are, are have been put in place. I won't go into particulars of them, but mm -hmm, we have mm -hmm. some protocols in place that I do believe I am very comfortable with. And I think the community is too, because we have been having conversation with various stakeholders of the community to vet this protocol at, before we submitted it to uh, the Department of Justice. With regards to the no knock warrant, we are currently working on that with council member at large, Elena Moreno uh, on that. Uh, she drafted a document resolution. We have. 60 days, so I think we may be maybe at day 50 or something like that, or a little less, but we are working with her in her office to uh, finalize that ordinance as well. So we're doing our due diligence to make sure that, and what I respect and what I appreciate out of all of this is that we are given the opportunity to be a part of the conversation and not just being left out of the conversation. Excellent, excellent. Chief, I'll, I'll end on, and I appreciate you as a good leader. You're you're being uh, thoughtful and retrospective, you know, analysis around that incident uh, on the bridge from June third. Some things that you know could have done better. We could have done better. Do you think supervision and our peer intervention training modules? Do you think they they worked that particular night? 
or do you think that there were things that we could have improved in those particular areas, peer intervention and supervision? I, I think they worked at night. I think that the, the biggest thing is that we uh we just had a, maybe had a breakdown in communication out there in the field per se, but the, the supervision was right there, Johnny on the spot uh, with everything. And, and there wasn't really anything for us to, to have that period, that epic moment per se at that moment. Uh, it was just some decisions that was made that we probably would have made later down in the protocol that we have now. And, and, and that is the difference in it, uh, establishing those steps, those check marks before we escalate to anything further okay. enforcement wise. Very good. Uh, Amy, I'm not sure if we are up against the clock at this point for us to begin our Q&A portion. Uh, I could certainly continue this wonderful informative dialogue with our chief, but I do wanna make sure our audience has an opportunity to ask some questions. Thank you for that. Uh, so in, in keeping with BGR tradition, it is time to shift to, um, to the audience Q&A. Uh, for our audience members, I'd like to remind you that if you'd like to submit a question, there's a Q&A icon at the bottom center of your screen, so you can just type in your question and hit send. Um, and so Chief Ferguson and Kenneth, thank you for that discussion. Uh, we've had many questions coming in that relate to sure. some of the topics that, that you've been talking mm -hmm. about. So we'll get started with the audience questions. Um, and this one follows immediately from the discussion we were just having. There are actually two questions about this. Uh, this audience member is asking for you, Chief Ferguson, to share NOPD's plan to involve the community in the creation of a policy addressing the use of less lethal weapons, for example, tear gas. How can interested community members become involved in the process? And then I've gotten a related question that says, what, which community organizations are you currently working with on this issue, so so process and sort of external mm -hmm. outreach. All right. So we've identified without getting into any specific names, but we we have worked with. Well, I definitely could say the independent monitor. We have worked with the independent monitor uh, through her. We her her office. We have identified some uh, other uh, constituents or stakeholders. Uh, some of our civil rights activists activists. Uh, who have reviewed this as well. Uh, plus, we heard the the comments that was received uh, after uh, the council's uh, presentation, which I had to go in front of the council and talk about that night. We had over a thousand comments and, and in using that and taking those comments into consideration is how we have drafted this as well as based on best practices in itself. Okay. Uh Another audience member is asking, um, how can we help communicate your community programs that are available? And is there a point of contact to share? So again, a desire to understand more how the community can be involved. Right, and that, that is a, a big part of why I have bringing back our non-PAC uh, meetings uh, outside of, you know, since we can't do it physically or face-to-face, -to, -face, to have these virtual meetings so that there can be a clear understanding as to the department's position and, and the captains having those direct conversations with their communities in which they are serving. That would then create that partnership, in my opinion, for uh, allowing them that opportunity to share what their concerns are, but also giving input on where they think we could or should improve. Another question. Amy, yeah. Amy I know, I'm sorry, I just wanted to just jump in for a moment. I know that the chief was was hesitant to identify certain community organizations that he's working with, but I am involved in a lot of dialogue with the chief and his staff as yeah. part of a number of organizations. Uh, Joe Givens is Icons for Peace, which is involved in, in improving partnerships with communities, particularly our youth community leaders uh, in, in OPD as well as our Crescent uh, City Corps, which is in, uh, assisting with in, improving local recruitment and implementing 21st century policing across more of our, our local uh, recruits. Uh, yeah, the police chief is absolutely supportive, has been uh, committed to both of those initiatives and uh, is committed to a long-term dialogue with both of those organizations. Thank you Thank for you. that clarification. Uh, that actually leads us into a related question. Um, this audience member is asking you, Chief Ferguson, what plans do you have to build on recent efforts like the Crescent City Corps that allow pr 
promising new officers to get training in racial equity leadership and restorative practices, as well as community engagement. If the resources are there, can you commit to offering this kind of training to all new officers? Yes, let me, let me tell you. So uh, I, I have to commend <laughs> Brent Godfrey. I have to commend <laughs> Kitty Polite. We, we, we did a pilot program over the last year, and, and I would like to also mention and thank Dean uh, Madeline Landry. We, 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 last year, we started a pilot program with young officers. And it, the goal was to identify 12 to 15 officers with less than three years on the job to try to give them some of the skills in leadership and becoming leaders within an organization, more specifically a law enforcement organization. And just last month, we had a graduation and to hear them give their testimony as to their experience over the last year and meeting with various leaders from across the city outside of law enforcement in itself, uh, you can hear the growth in them. So I am all for it. And I know Brent has reached out and we, we're discussing more in which there are some people who are willing to invest more into this program. And I think if I had the funding, absolutely, as well as the time, because it does take time, but the funding and the time to do this, I would definitely incorporate this for every new officer because I think it is well worth it. Thank you. Uh, all right, here's another question. Um, again, for you, Chief Ferguson, there was a tremendous reduction in gun violence particularly gang violence in recent years through GVRS and the multi-agency gang unit. What is your opinion of that initiative and are you continuing it? And I think context for our audience would also be, could you explain the initiative? Yes. So in the past, New Orleans Police Department had a unit, multi-agency gang unit, in which they address violent crime uh, collectively within our department, uh, specifically uh, targeting those violent uh, group, violent groups or violent individuals throughout our city. So we continue to have a gang unit. We continue to have, right now, we continue to have our tiger unit. Uh, we are looking at exploring that, exploring the, the responsibility of these particular groups. To It was initially developed or formulated for uh, armed robbery and carjacking, things of that nature. We want to explore it now to expand to shootings, firearm offenses, as well as the armed robbery. So we are looking at some initiatives and I think in the very near future, the, the, the public, the city will be very happy with the direction in which we will be transitioning to. Uh, over the next few weeks, you would definitely hear some more information about what we're doing to improve those very uh, entities that they're speaking of. And Amy, I'll, I'll just jump in because obviously the MAG unit was something that was implemented mm -hmm. uh, during the time that I was U.S. attorney. And, yes. I, and so I worked quite a bit with the department. It was housed uh, actually at ATF. <laughs> and we had a high level of coordination across uh, local, state and federal resources with, you know, NOPD officers working shoulder to shoulder with ATF and FBI agents and DEA agents to make uh, those investigations related to group violence and ultimately deciding where uh, the appropriate venue was for prosecution, whether it was the, the state DA or the, the, the U.S. Attorney's Office. And we did have a great deal of success. I, I, the, the, regardless of what name or what moniker you slap on it, the key is that we have to have coordination, more so in the city of New Orleans, the greater New Orleans area than any place else where, you know, Violence knows no parish boundaries, right? <laughs> we have yeah. victims and perpetrators that e easily cross between Jefferson Parish, St. Tammany, Orleans Parish, St. Bernard Parish, and so forth. Uh, and so it requires our local law enforcement officers, NOPD, working with our, our various sheriffs in the thir 13 parishes uh, in Southeast Louisiana to coordinate. It requires us to coordinate with state police. It requires us to leverage the resources of the federal uh, agencies uh, that are housed in the New Orleans area to, to really, really implement a, a comprehensive approach to investigating and prosecuting and ultimately eradicating that type of violence. Thank you. Uh, here's a question that's actually, I'm gonna pose it to each of you. Um, what are some public misconceptions about local law enforcement. And Kenneth, maybe you can go first on this one. 
Well, I, I, I think one misconception uh, about local law enforcement is that uh, we are not representative of the communities that we serve. And uh, I think many people are aware of my own uh, connection to NOPD. My father was a 37 year veteran of NOPD. I have a brother who currently serves in the Houston Police Department. I've had a number of other family members that have served uh, in NOPD as well. And the reality is, you know, unlike a number of other jurisdictions, and I'm not, not to suggest that this isn't a problem of having law enforcement not reflective of the community that they serve, that's certainly something that we see in other places. New Orleans is not one of them. And I, mm -hmm. I, I'd leave mm -hmm. it to the chief to, to opine a, a bit in terms of the statistics around uh, how NOPD really reflects the, race, the racial makeup of, of the, the city. I think some of the gender challenges, we certainly could improve in terms of the number of women that we have serving in, this, in these capacities. But on a, uh, from a racial standpoint, NOPD in many, in many ways does reflect uh, the makeup of the city of New Orleans. Yeah, and Ken is correct with that. You know, and the biggest thing is, I think the biggest misconception is that many feel, okay, yes, when you become a police officer, we, we always say, okay, you become a family of, you have be, just joined a family of blue, but it is not a family of blue saying it's us against them, meaning the department against the community. But we do know, that, you know what, what occupation do you walk out of your door with a bulletproof vest on and a gun on your side? Uh, so when you're walking out of your door, leaving your family behind and going to that, to your assignment, you're depending on that family to get you back home to your, your primary family. So it's not a us against them. We just try to get everyone to realize that we are, we do become a family because we have to take care of one another, but we also have to hold one another accountable. And, and Kenny hit, right on the, hit the nail right on the head. Uh, what we have that works so well for us is that we are reflective of other community in which we serve. 53% African-American, 40% white. Now he did mention the fact that we can improve. And I agree with regards to gender, 77% male, 23% female. But we have been seeing a slight increase in female over the last few years. And while this occupation right now in 2020 is seeing some challenges because of the scrutiny, because of the microscope in which it is under, uh, we as a city have truly been blessed to continue to be able to recruit and hire officers to join our team and serve our city. Thank you. Here's another question. Given that NOPD represents one of the largest percentages in the city's budget, many New Orleanians will find it difficult to agree with the position Chief Ferguson expresses regarding allocating even more funds to the department. Chief, what might cause you to reconsider your position and support the community call to reallocate funds to education, housing, and other research-based research methods of reducing crime. So let me say that I, I have no, I am, on, I am on the same page with everyone. I agree that we need to fund at the front with education, with mental health, with homelessness. Uh, I'm just simply saying that I, I do not think uh, taking funding away from policing is the answer. Uh, as you can see now, we are dealing with violent crime, an increase in violent crime. Crime fighting is our responsibility. And if you take funding away from us in this manner, we will not be able to address crime as we should be able to now. Again, removing some of those non-criminal incidents from under our purview and allowing us to address the crime will work in our, it will work for everyone, in my opinion. But uh, we definitely just taking funding away from the police department is not the answer. Amy, if I could, if yeah, yeah, if I could, if I could just jump in, I, I do want to make sure that we are uh, fully educating ourselves around this issue and mm -hmm. fully appreciating how how much money it takes to achieve some of the community trust that we all want. We all recognize that we want our police and our public to be better connected. We want them to, to pursue justice while preserving public safety. 
but I, I just want to throw out there, the 1994 Crime uh, Control Act, which we all know often gets vilified related to the mass incarceration issue, certainly concur with many of those concerns. But what that act also included was $6.1 billion in investment for prevention programs, weed and seed, if you remember that, Chief. Things like curfew centers and community policing stations that were funded at that level that has not been <laughs> replicated at the federal level um, since then that requires uh, that level of an investment, again, from the federal level to see improvement in terms of prevention work. We didn't see was one where we were directly giving money to local neighborhood organizations to improve on the prevention and intervention side, $6.1 billion. Where does that money come from now? When you talk about uh, things like community relations services, the community oriented uh, policing services, the COPS program, consent decrees, which are now down from over 20 back in the Obama administration, now down to about five to six. They are very costly. They are very expensive. Again, when you think about the, the, the predicted or, or, or requested slash in the Department of Justice budget, and I won't go into the exact numbers, 400, 500 million dollars that this current administration has requested, the slashes that you're seeing are directly in those areas, directly in areas that are targeted to improving things like investing in body-worn cameras, improving community relations uh, on our streets, community improving community-oriented policing. Again, if we want to see improvements in community policing, if we want to see improvements in prevention and intervention, what we have to see is greater investment from the federal side. And if I could add to that, Amy, I think Ken, he and I talk about this a lot, and that it, transparency is our foundation, and, and that is what has been the key to our success in building trust with our community. So in order to have that transparency, the body want cameras, the technology that we have, constitutional policing that we are leading reforms in, there's a cost to that. But with that cost also comes trust from the community and knowing that we are doing what is right by our community. And that is why you do not see the, the, the violent protests that you've seen across the country. Because of those investments that we have made, we're able to have this community trust and input and move forward collectively. Thank you both for that. Uh, shifting gears, we have an audience member asking um, about the French border and security in the French border. So. Uh, she writes, New Orleans has used a variety of stopgap measures to address public safety concerns in the French Quarter, including state police patrols, the New Orleans Task Force, and NOLA Patrol. Um, Superintendent Ferguson, what do you view as the longer term solution to this problem? That, 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 that is a great question. That is what we're in discussion about right now, identifying what can we do differently. I mean, I mean, as we discussed earlier, the Mid-City Patrol, the Lakeview Patrol that are done by officers, New Orleans police officers, is that something that we could actually do? I know we have the French Quarter Task Force, but some of that funding from, um, from that, that funds Troop N, can we use some of that to have more officers to patrol in the French Quarter area? Let me say the 8th District has the, the most officers of all districts but however, they are the most, they are the smallest geographically of all districts as well. So we, we continue to invest in the French Quarter area. We continue to uh, ensure safety in the French Quarter, just as we do is in every other part of our city. Thank you. Kenneth, uh, I have a question that's directed to you. Um, can you suggest any innovative or alternative techniques used by other jurisdictions to reduce crime that we should import into New Orleans? My view, again, always goes to the question around uh, intervention and uh, prevention. And, and, and again, I think we, we oftentimes look at the face of young people uh, as being the, the, the culprits here. Uh, I think we oftentimes lose sight of the trauma that is affecting many of our young people, uh, whether they're dealing with incarcerated 
parents themselves, whether they're dealing with violence in their own communities, whether they're dealing with uh, trauma from environmental concerns. Uh, I, I do think that trauma informed care, whether that is invested in our healthcare systems, our criminal justice systems, our educational systems. Uh, we've seen success by investing in trauma informed care, trauma informed uh, uh, essentially operations of all of those institutions. I think that is an absolutely vital part of, of what we're talking about. There's a number of programs uh, I'd point to, including uh, Becoming a Man, which is uh, uh, an intervention program model based out of Chicago, which has had a great deal of success. Uh, but we've got a number of initiatives locally, like Youth Empowerment Project and uh, Silverback Society and Son of a Saint that are doing tremendous work on the ground in New Orleans. They've, these are organizations that have now uh, proven track records of success in intervening and preventing violence in the lives of young people. Uh, again, I don't think we need to look that far. Uh, the, the question is, should we be making a, an increase in investment in some of these organizations um, so that we see a youth empowerment project essentially on steroids so that it is able to amplify the work that they the amplify the work and the reach that it has to young people are we able to hit uh, a, a, a button to increase the capacity Um, seems like we've maybe had a technical glitch with volume. Chief Ferguson, can you still hear me? Yes, I can. I, I, I was okay. checking my computer. I was okay. making sure it wasn't me. Hey, Ken, right. we, we couldn't hear you. Ken, if we might have lost a, a bit of your final um, comments there, but so, so we are we're coming up on the hour. Chief Ferguson, would you like to add um, to that response? And then I'll have one final question for you. I mean, the biggest thing is, 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 is what he mentioned, what Kenny Polite mentioned. We, we have to look at ways in which we could do things differently. But no matter what we come up with, it, it, it requires funding. Uh, we have, uh, with the assistance of the Police and Justice Foundation, uh, created our PALS program, Police Activities League, a police athletic league, in which we're trying to engage our youth from a law enforcement standpoint and, and create a mentorship program or partnership with our youth and letting them know that we're here for them and with them and not against them. So it it, it, it would take different initiatives such as those to, to build our youth up. Thank you. Okay, so our final question um, for both of you. In considering the future of policing in New Orleans for each of you, um, sort of what gives you hope or forms the basis for optimism and share that with our audience so that they too can kind of have that as their basis for going forward. I'll start now. I'll, I'll, can you hear me now, Amy? Is this yeah. uh, a little bit better here? Uh, I'll start yes. and, and give the chief the last word here, but I am optimistic uh, about the, the consent decree process and some of the much needed reforms that have resulted from it. Uh, the commitment that we are seeing to the, 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 the ultimate success of that process uh, and, and, and frankly, you know, this was the most comprehensive consent decree that the Department of Justice ever pursued. Uh, we are nearing substantial compliance to that. And, and I'm optimistic that we have the commitment from both the officers on the ground, as well as from NOPD leadership, that many of those reforms are now institutionalized in both policy and training and will not go away once that substantial compliance and the consent decree have been accomplished. I think Ken said, I mean, I am very optimistic. Uh, the, the culture of the New Orleans Police Department has changed from what it was prior to the consent decree into where we are now. And with the policies and procedures and the leadership that we have and the commitment from this leadership, the sustainability is set, is etched in stone. Uh, and, and we continue, as long as we continue to be open and transparent and own the good as well as the bad and be willing to have the dialogue, no matter how difficult it may be, we will continue to move forward as a department as well as a city. So I'm very optimistic. All right, thank you both. 
I'm afraid that's all the time that we've had today, um, that, that we have for today. And we really appreciate your speaking with us and sharing your thoughts with our audience. Uh, I want to, again, express gratitude to Iberia Bank, First Horizon, for its generous sponsorship of this breakfast briefing. Um, a recording of today's breakfast briefing will be available on our website, bgr.org. The best way to stay on top of all BGR events and research is to become a member. We regularly engage with our members about our public policy work, and we value this dialogue. We also rely on our members to help amplify BGR policy recommendations. If you're not currently a member, please visit bgr.org to join the ranks of concerned citizens working to improve local governance. We hope this event has been informative. We wish you and yours the very best in the days and weeks to come, and we look forward to seeing you at our next event.